on ground. Okay, it's like taking one of those live sitcoms with the live, you know, applause and laugh track instead of can one. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'd like to start by um, acknowledging the uh, present day Fernandina Takavi Band of Mission Indians on whose land we was occupied land we are standing. Um, as I've been reading about them, one of the things I'm learning that's really interesting is the, the pattern of um, settlement in this area. Um, and one of the, these were all linguistic groups in, in this part of um, the continent, and they did not form political entities or nations in the sense of tribal groups like in the in the East, the Iroquois, the Cherokee, which formed very big nations. Um, and the, um, the social organization in this region in particular was about communities of lineage, small communities, like all of these settlements were about under 200 people um, that um, existed through trade um, and shared ceremonies and intermarriage. Um, and this um, pattern seems to have existed back into uh, prehistory, pre-Western pre, pre history. Uh, our ancestors in the region lived in autonomous lineages within villages. These tribal lineages or tribes consisted of speakers from the Takic branch of the Bucho Aztecan language, who intermarried with individuals from other linguistic groups in the area, as well as strengthened economic, social, and cultural relations with those outside their language group by practicing exotic exogeny, marriage, and so the group. So the, the idea of a linguistic speaking group, I think I think it's a nice it's a nice thing for us to think about because we are also some kind of linguistic speaking group. Um, we speak a very strange language indeed, a hybrid language. Um, so tonight it's it's really a pleasure to welcome uh, two collaborators, Sergio Foster and Arturo Ernesto Romon. Um, who are here to, we're here to celebrate their, their new book, um, E-L-A-D-A-T-L, -E A History of the East Los Angeles Dirigible Air Transit Lines. Um, I'm not going to introduce them individually, other than to say that one's a writer and one's an artist. Um, you'll have to guess which. The, um, but I want to say two or three things about, about this remarkable novel. One is what you will hear tonight is only a small section of it because it is so densely and beautifully packed with, with text and images, but also with, with two things perhaps um, that I, I find extraordinary. And one would be a, an incredible, a fantastically, incre I mean like phantasm, fantastically incredible attention to location. And that location is East Los Angeles where both of our guests um, are from. Um, so an attention to community, to place, to uh, things that can be seen and touched and things that cannot be seen and touched. Another is an attention to labor, um, an attention to actual physical labor um, rendered in a language that to me is, is a wonder to see and a rarity to see. Um, the third thing is the a, a relationship between a utopia, right, which is which is sort of this phantasmic dirigible transit line um, that that resembles in a way our not very you know developed um, public transportation system in LA, um, but also doesn't resemble it. Um, and the link between utopia and dystopia. And one of the things I think you hear in, in the material tonight is that in every kind of utopic vision of the world, there's a dystopian shadow. And in every dystopian, um, every dystopian work, there's also a, a utopian phantasm that lurks behind it. And then rather than explain that in academic terms, I think you'll hear it in what you're about to see. Welcome, Arturo and Sashu Bravo.
Matthias, thanks to Teller for having us. Thank you all for coming today. Um, so we have a few silent movies embedded in the presentation. Um, you yeah, have beautiful soundtrack, but you just have to imagine. <laughs> but it was just, it was just uh, music. Um, but we're going to start with a, a commercial for the East LA dirigible transport line. This is it. <laughs> <laughs> And earlier we heard that um, some of you have questions, and we'd appreciate if you could participate with those, like take some of your questions out or have them in mind, and because we want to hear them. Yeah, our goal is kind of to take your questions and let that inform what we read. So it's kind of an improvisation, which we like to do, and you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So yeah, but we appreciate all like these work all the time. Always doesn't work all the time. <laughs> Been updated. You say two thousand and nine. Right. The soundtrack you just heard was actually from uh, our Uli record called Orquestas Típicas, which was a uh, was a collection of what would you say like nineteen twenties music, uh, ballroom dance music from the borderlands between the United States and Mexico. So, we'd like a question. Who can, who can give us a question? Yes, Mike. Uh, thank you. Um, it seems one of the things you've touched upon with this piece and, and listening to you earlier today is the importance of travel and the ability to travel in a community. Uh, to close with, as you spoke about, you know, East LA, the five ways coming together and have those those two things the necessity of people having access to public transportation and easy transportation and yet also the uh, dangers that too much uh, in one place can, can can bring I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit in context of the, of the book of the importance of travel to East LA and being able to get around and, and forming a community uh, and how the the, the, the dirigible Sort of represents that in, in the book. Well, the freeways go through East LA. They actually have destroyed East LA as a as a community to a large degree, created a lot of divisions. Um, and um, I've heard the same thing happen in many cities across the country. I was just hearing about Baltimore. Baltimore, it's like whole uh, project to develop a more equitable uh, public transit system that was then kind of like destroyed and then all the money that was supposed to go into that more equitable transit system actually went to wealthier white suburbs. It's a kind of disinvestment of the, of the uh, place that black and brown and working class people live and the hyper investment in outlying areas of white suburbia. Um, and I think the, 
transit, like, for me, transit can tell us a lot about like where, what we value and who we dream, what we dream for people. Um, and obviously, like dirigible was, a, was kind of a utopian project. Like, uh, like Sasha was saying earlier, it was this, it was this dream of lighter than air transport that would shrink the world down and kind of make a global community by making things like three hours away instead of three weeks away. Um, so I think that's one of, that's one of the through lines with with uh, with transportation in the novel. Um, and the reality of East LA and a lot of other cities, like the the stated purpose of transportation, which is to connect people, actually, actually separates people. Um, and so I think that's one of the through lines of the book. It's one of the things that we were playing with. So an alternative reality of transportation is one that's actually literally everyone and doesn't disrupt them. Okay. So that speaks to um, the dirigible as a metaphor as a metaphor for those 20th century mm, ideologies that, that attempted to unite people um, and had, had their explosive uh, cataclysmic uh, failures in the often, often case. Um, and uh, um, so initially the, the Dirigible was proposed as a kind of uniting figure in the narrative. Um, but during the course of research uh, in, the, in the writing of the novel, um, uh, we found out that, that, uh, that it actually wasn't a fictional idea. That if you look back in the in the twentieth century, um, uh, these things were were um, you know fact, had factual basis that um, uh, that people attempted to make these come to pass, um, and so um, yeah uh, yeah I guess. Uh, so, for example, um, while we were researching Evergreen Cemetery, the oldest cemetery in Los Angeles, a non-segregated cemetery, so um, Japanese Americans um, are buried there next to African Americans and and um, and white people and um, and other kinds of dead people. Um, uh, uh, James Banning is buried there. Uh, he has a headstone that's only about this big, only has his name, says James Banning. Uh, it says like his birth and date, death dates, and his birth date was something like 1900, and he died from around like 1930, 1933, something like that. And it says fly with Banning. And that's all it says on it. So a kind of mysterious headstone. But if you Google James Banning, find out that he was the first African-American licensed commercial pilot in the United States. He was the first pilot to fly continental, uh, fly from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, and like, uh, like a lot of the pilots of his uh, time, uh, died in a stunt crash um, and, uh, and got buried in East LA. Um, so he's He's a historical figure, but how much of that history do you know? Um, and so, yeah, so we'll read a part that, that interpolates some actual history with the, with the narrative of this novel. Um, so, do you know the story of Frances Farmer? She was a movie star. Her mother had her committed to a psychiatric hospital where they gave her a lobotomy. What about Bessie Coleman? She was the first American to get an international pilot's license. But she got in France because they refused to teach her how to fly in America. And the first African-American woman to get her pilot's license back in 1921. But she could only make a living doing dangerous stunt flying, and it killed her. In 1926, she lost control of her plane, and it spun out and blew her at 2,000 feet above the ground, so she died. She was 34. 
Of course, she was the inspiration for the Bessie Coleman Aero Club. Now this is basic history of the skies of Los Angeles. So you're supposed to know this already. The Bessie Coleman Aero Club was founded in 1929 by William Powell here in LA, where Powell learned to fly because the Los Angeles Warren School of Aeronautics was the only place in the country where he was allowed, because he was black, to take flying lessons. Powell, who owned a chain of five gas stations, became a licensed pilot, navigator, and aeronautical engineer. He started an airplane company, Bessie Coleman Aero, to lay the foundation for a new future for African Americans. In his book, Black Wings, Powell wrote, quote, there's a better job and a better future in aviation for Negroes than in any other industry. And the reason is this, aviation is just beginning its period of growth. And if we get into it now while, while it is still uncrowded, we can grow as aviation grows, end quote. Powell had a major plan and this was his plan. Quote, Negro leaders, why do you sleep? Black men and black women, arouse your imaginations. Act before it is too late. Do not let the aviation industry become completely monopolized by other races who will give you and me only the most menial jobs. Get into aviation now while we have the chance to get black airplane manufacturers, black airplane distributors, owner of black transport lines, and thousands of black boys and black girls profitably employed in, the great paint, in a great paint industry." Unquote. That was Powell's plan. It would eliminate, quote, continually begging the white people for jobs, unquote. He started a black aviation newsletter where he offered scholarships to black students, male and female alike, who wanted to learn how to fly. Everywhere in the nation, black people were discriminated against, excluded, exploited, and oppressed. There were lynch mobs, racial covenants in real estate, John Birch hate groups, segregated schools, Jim Crow laws, Ku Klux Klan terrorist organizations, and white supremacy holding forth in the media. Al said the aerospace industry that was just beginning would allow Negroes to slip the surly bonds of earth leaving all that horrible bullshit behind as black people flew, literally flew into the future. His plan almost worked as Bessie Coleman Aero Clubs formed in major cities across the U.S. If only the Great Depression hadn't ruined his businesses, and then Powell himself died of lung failure caused by injuries from poison gas in World War I. So William Powell's plan didn't work out, it's true. Bessie Coleman Aero Clubs went bankrupt, faded away. Powell's vision faded away too and has been forgotten for the most part. These dreams and their, th these people and their dreams became part of the history of the skies over Los Angeles. But Erica Yanera didn't want people to forget about it or think it was all just dream. She published articles about Powell, the Bessie Coleman Aero Club, and the Black Wings Company, the second aircraft manufacturing company William Powell founded and the even earlier Sonora Aero Club, which Charles Belchel documented in unpublished manuscripts located by Fred Washington, Enrique Pico, and the East Los Angeles Dirigible Air Transport Lines, which we have spent months and years researching in order to document the remains of that infrastructure, of their lines that once extended throughout Southern California, into Northern California, and through the Southwest. Both abandoned airfields, anchoring stations, hydrogen and helium filling depots, hangars, etc. Okay, um, so why don't we stop there with, with that section? But you know, so that was um, one of the one of the coincidences that we find out that we propose to write um, a mythology of uh, lighter than airships and an organization that. Uh, intends to use lighter than our air, lighter than air airships as an organization to uplift people out of exploitation and poverty and oppression, and then we find out that it was actually a, that there was people who worked on that exact same kind of project in the exact same area of the San Gabriel Valley, like eighty years before eighty years before us. Eight years before we were around, um, and uh, yeah, um, uh, there was there was a woman who I, I read uh, a part of this at at an 
Associate Writers Writing Program Conference in, at the Convention Center in, in downtown LA. And a woman raised her hand and she said, but, but what if the only thing that people know about Bessie Coleman is what you just read in your book? So, yeah. <laughs> I hope you have more questions because if that's all you know, then yeah. So my question's about food. There's a lot of food in the book, a lot of eating, and a lot of um, getting of food. Especially butchery, butchery of chickens, um, mm -hmm. which connects to the labor, all the labor, visible and invisible, on that food. And like the food part is is what I would call realism, right? It's very it's highly descriptive. Is you can taste the food, right? So I wonder if you might. <laughs> you might you might want to give us a little something to eat. Okay. You want to? You find it, I'll, I'll talk about it. Okay. Yeah, you talk about it. <laughs> um, so my cousin, my cousin is an urban farmer. Um, about 20 years ago, he actually started talking to his grandmother, who grew up on a farm in Zacatecas in Mexico, and asking her to share her knowledge. And then he took that knowledge and started uh, an urban farm in the in the Northeast LA community of Basel Park. Um, and so through the period of writing the book, um, we were just beginning to learn about poultry raising, um, slaughtering of chickens and other animals for meat, um, and how to do that. That's the only time I killed chickens. Yeah, and then I invited Seshu and he helped he helped me kill some chickens one day. Um, and uh, we also we also invited my cousin to a series of performances called the Recent Rupture Radio Hour, which were kind of like this. You know, when an institution would invite us to do an artist talk, generally they're inviting you to talk about your work. Um, and, <laughs> uh, yeah. And um, and what we figured is that our work isn't limited to like our ourselves, right? Um, it's actually a communal effort. Like without my community, I can't produce work. Um, I'm not like this individual artist. Um, I'm always in collaboration with the community uh, to to make my work. It's not possible without it. Um, and so, to try to flip the artist talk, we started doing a series of uh, fake radio shows where we would just be the hosts and we would invite people, all the geniuses of our community to talk about what they do. And what we found out really quickly were, was that uh, Reyes is like the most popular guest. He just showed up every single time and really impressed everybody. And it spoke to people's maybe their curiosity and disconnection from the labor of eating and the labor of food and, um, and just our biological connection to what we eat. Uh, he was always always popular and overshadowed us every single time. So, mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, he's overshadowing us again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like, it's page 40. Um, uh, yeah, so, um, so there is this chapter called Chicken Man, and we didn't put his name there because he doesn't need more publicity. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so um, so part of the book comes out of these um, panel presentations that we did as a kind of live magazine format uh, before audiences at UCLA Fowler Museum, the Cal State LA, um, the Da Arts Center in Pomona, um, and, and other venues, uh, community venues, and, and so forth, um, where. We did a Q&A and each artist presented something of their work. Then we had a dialogue and, and people asked questions um, related to the, the role of those artists in the, in the community. Um, all right, so, so here, luckily we changed his name. So. <laughs> One time I went to the Renteria's farm in the hills of Happy Valley, following Jose's detailed directions 
without which I would probably end up lost somewhere, driving to some unfortunate alternate reality of a sci-fi Los Angeles, never having the opportunity to join the UFO club of greater East Los Angeles, to miss out on never finding my destiny. I went to the farm to kill chickens, or roosters rather, because the hens serve the purpose of laying eggs and therefore don't need to be killed. But the rooster just fuss and fight all the time, harass and rape the hens, and need to be killed. Because I'm a chicken eater and I eat chicken each week, I felt it was my duty to help Jose and Vicky cull their chickens. By the time I got there up on the hillside by the shed, they had a big pot heated to exactly 140 degrees. I don't know if that's real. Um, 114. 114, that's a lie. Okay. <laughs> or whatever the exact scientific temperature is for immersing the dead chickens in extremely hot water so that their feathers slough off as easily as feathers falling out of a torn pillow. And Jose and Leaky were already at work, cutting the rooster's heads off, letting them bleed out in buckets, throwing the bodies into a big pot, which it was immediately apparent on entering the area, released a stench of chicken death, of scorched dusty feathers, bird blood, bird fear, punctuated now and then by the snapping off of yellow chicken feet, also tossed into a bucket to be later thrown away because no one except Olga wanted to cook or eat chicken feet. Leaky handed me an apron and a knife. There's gloves if you want them, he said. Leaky's chicken killing machine consisted of a piece of plywood onto which he had screwed a plastic lunch traffic cone upside down. At this point, there was a wash of blood streaming down the plywood into the bucket where the heads ended up. The cone made cutting the rooster's head off easy. He stuffed the rooster head first into the cone, so the head protruded out of the bottom. The rooster blinked, mouth open, wondering what the hell. They were so trusting. They lived their lives on this hillside, fighting with each other and raping the hens, endless free food, safe in the wire pens, once in a while menaced by raccoons or coyotes who dug underneath or climbed overhead. And now they were hung upside down with their heads sticking out of a traffic cone? What was that awful smell? Why is there blood on this board? They don't try to peck you. This is uncomfortable, you pulling my head like this. You pull my neck out, stretch it for the knife, and cut off the head. The body flaps and kicks. Blood spurts out and drips toward the bucket. Toss the head. After the body stops moving, pass it to Jose and Leaky, who are scorching the feathers and removing them. That's the dirty job. After the dark feathers are yanked out, the outer feathers and the long wing feathers and under feathers, with that stench of filth and death, pale, loose pimpled, naked chicken skin revealed itself. And I had never seen it before. But after the feathers came out, out of the same pores the feathers came out, long filaments of pale, mucus extruded in spaghetti-like secretions. No wonder we like our chicken quite crispy. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so that that was from the urban farm, and, and uh, um, last week Arturo gave me, gave me a 12 pack of eggs from, from his chickens that he's still exploiting in that manner. <laughs> 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 But like, yeah, they invite me to the farm, but I don't. Um, all right. so. We got a question back there. Right. Um, I was hoping you could talk about kind of two things. Can you talk a little bit about collaboration both with each other and the community that you are part of? Because it seems really interesting. And also a, a little bit about morality, because it seems like from this reading that uh, like oral storytelling plays a pretty big part. The so morality collaboration. The the question. Let me let me rephrase the question. So the question was, can we talk about more about collaboration and uh, related to the community yeah. and morality in the work? Um, well, I, I think I think like we were talking about earlier the. Part of the practice that we started with was documenting a, a place, like documenting East LA, and um, and that required a certain type of um, 
certain, certain type of approach, a certain type of ethic. And um, I think for, I was learning as I was going, um, you know, just to be perfectly honest, I was learning as I was going and um, kind of learning the, the, the ethics and the hidden morality of documentation as I was doing it. So taking a photo is like very charged, like a very charged um, action. And framing a photo is like a, you're doing all these series of choices. And then doing it within community is different than parachuting into somebody else's community and taking those same photos, right? So there's like a whole history of exploitation in just the medium of photography. Um, and in the medium of like documentation, anthropological studies, all that type of stuff. And I was actually learning that as, a, as we were trying to follow this instinct or, or impetus to document a place. Because at the same time when we were starting um, documenting a place, East LA was, um, was kind of like a hidden place. It was a place that was exploited and underrepresented. Um, and so our impulse was to share stories that don't get shared. Um, through the complications of learning about documentation, um, I think that we, we came upon the idea of using, of, of, of using um, fiction, of storytelling, um, as, as a way to be respectful of the place that we're from. Um, it's still, I mean, it's still really complex. It's to, to be an artist in a place is, is, a, is a dynamic position. Um, but, but I would say like um, our collaboration, like the, the ethics of our collaboration is, is usually one that's based on um, improvisation, but also um, openness, um, non-competitiveness. And I think that, that those, like, those types of collaborations are also part of how we approach working within a community. Um, not sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very complicated question. It's a really good one to practice with, like, rather than answer. Like I think it's a better, a better like um, better question to like live through and, and practice with for sure. But I but I could also say that Arturo has a continual practice of collaboration with the Northeast Alliance with. Other with other artists and community groups, um, that that is, you know, part of his daily or weekly practice. Uh, he runs the farm with his with with the unmentioned chicken man, um, and uh, so so he's continually collaborating um, with with people at different levels in the community. Um, we did a. Um, we did a text and image zine workshop with uh, with uh, undocumented immigrant students at Alhambra High School um, because I was asked by the mayor of Alhambra if I would be the poet laureate of Alhambra, and so I asked her what what would the poet laureate of Alhambra do, and she said maybe like read a poem before the opening of the city council. I was like, <laughs> I was like, you know, like I heard you had this dream, uh, this dream center for undocumented students at Alhambra High School. You know, get us money and and, and um, materials, and we'll work with those those kids. Um, so, um, so yeah, um, people come to us. We go to people. Ruben Guevara. Uh, who's a musician. He has a new memoir out about it being a musician in East LA. Like he's, he's like 70 something, like 75, or I don't know, he's old. Um, but you know, so he started in doo-wop and then he went into rock and roll and his band opened for Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention in the 70s. And, um, and uh, he did a lot of, uh, of illegal or listed or immoral acts with different people. Um, and he wrote about them in his new book. Um, and one of those people said, that book should never have been published. Um, his, book is, his book is called um, uh, Memoirs of a Chicano, um, um, 
Yeah, anyway, he has a new book out, and, and it's all in there. Um, but we interviewed him, you know, before he before he published his book, we were interviewing him. We interviewed other people related to uh, the sites that he performed at, the, um, the VEX, uh, the, the punk, the punk venue that that was like just run by the musicians themselves. Um, uh, yeah, and interviewed other people and, and documented some of these on the ELA guide site, the website that has downloadable walking and, and uh, driving tours that you can print out and, and walk around and drive around and look at some of these, these sites where, you know, it was like majorly important that for some of these kids to like waste their lives in punk, concerts, spitting on each other, or whatever they did in those days. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I just say also that um, that, uh, that artists artists are sometimes seen as, as like the elites in their community. And, um, but we need to show up at, as community members. And sometimes that means like broadening our idea of what community is and Sometimes it means like asking ourselves the questions like, who do we speak to? Like, who is our community? Who is our audience that we're speaking to? And even what is the purpose of my work within this context of community? So, uh, such you, if you ever have like a fundraiser or a good cause, just call Seshu. He'll show up. He'll be. Um, he's always willing to show up as a writer. Like the the literature and the and the poetics, get in, you know, are involved in the politics of community and the yeah. same with me um, as I'm a visual artist um, but I'm also a member of a community that has a lot of challenges that's undergoing like hypergentrification um, and so I show up the best way I can um, as my full self including being an artist and whatever skills I have I'm willing to to offer those and I think that's maybe that's what I was getting at <laughs> uh, maybe that's what I was getting at in terms of like, how does, what does the action look like beyond just kind of standing inside, documenting, and like producing beautiful pictures, right? It means like showing up in your community when things are happening. Um, interview with one fish, two fifty-eight. Let's do an interview. So um, this is an interview with one fish. He was like a mythic, mythical character. We noticed that as we went around these different places. Uh, in East LA, uh, that we would see this um, orange, like, I don't know what it was, like 1950, like Ford Apache truck. Like 1950, and then it had on the side of it one fish garage, and it was so old that it didn't have like a, um, like it had that, it had that word at the beginning that was a, uh, an exchange. It was an exchange. Then it had a partial number. It didn't have like an area code. It was like before area codes. And it's still on the, the truck. And so we as we were driving, you know, dozens or hundreds of miles around East LA, we would see this truck every once in a while now and then um, in different places. And so so we developed a whole series of questions for this guy, Juan Fish, who seemed to have been you know, in the community for, um, you know, 50 years or more, or 60 years, and um, and therefore we must know a lot. And so, um, so I, I put together a bunch of, of questions, some random questions that, um, some of which I got out of the LA Times, and which I would have, would have asked him, like number one, what is the purpose of mystery? And he would have said, one later afternoon, I spot one fish who was smaller than I remembered him, leaning against the side of his truck in the shade of a Chinese owl in Lincoln Heights, as if waiting for someone. I previously asked him if I could ask him some questions about his experience in the city, and he had tentatively agreed. I see him waiting in the street. He looks, he looks almost exactly like the same guy. And I think this might be the perfect moment, but now he acts like he doesn't remember me. Furthermore, as if he doesn't even really understand the question, he just kind of frowns and gives me a distracted nod, as if only just now noticing me and my pen and clipboard. Then he looks away, as if perhaps I might just go away. But I continue to stand there asking questions. What is the purpose of death? 
I'm not sure I what are these questions supposed to be about? I thought you were talking about something else. I don't really death. Death. The purpose of death is to get rid of the dead people in case they haven't noticed. Imagine if they just stuck around, hanging around forever and ever, never got the message that somewhere along the line they had stopped living. Some people won't get the message, I guess. Death and time, you know. Time goes by, people die. Death and time, tick, tick, tick. What's the purpose of ball lightning around General Hospital, especially on winter nights? I'm not really familiar with anything like that, so I don't know. I did hear there used to be a Zeppelin launching pad on the top of the building where they would anchor the Zeppelins to a lightning rod they used to have up there. But they planned this whole other lighter than air patient delivery system to avoid street congestion on the ground. But that was, that was when they used to plan things like that and have alternative ideas about how to make the city better. But I don't know what happened to that. Maybe those ideas went out with the red cars or even before that. What is the purpose of winter? What is the purpose of these questions? Damn. <laughs> Who funds the campaign headquarters in the campaign of hate? Well, your best bet there, check out Michael Sinsoon and their coalition against police abuse. You know he fought against that type of thing, organizing community support for a game truce. What's the effect on personal health of all these moving lights, particularly these moving lights? Sometimes at night you see moving lights from room to room in a house across the street. What effect does that have on us? Hold on a sec. At this point, one fish abruptly stands up, stands up straight, walks around the cap of his pickup, and gets behind the wheel. I follow, pen and pad ready, as he's gunning the engine, releasing a cloud of white exhaust in the street. I lean over and look in his window, but he drives away. It takes a number of weeks before I'm able to catch up with Juan Fish again. The guy gives me pretty much exactly the same look when I pull up my pen and clipboard and say, about these questions, I just needed a few more minutes. And I'm confident he remembered what we were discussing. And my confidence in his perspective and point of view were such that I think you have to determine to follow these things through to the end. I want to ask about spots I sometimes see. The doctors couldn't find anything, so what about these spots I sometimes see, which ride like serpents across my eyesight? Do they exist? Hey, I was talking to my cousin. He said that he saw you. He said that you were doing better. But you know, I can't really talk right now. I got stuff to take care of, so I'll see you around, all right? After that encounter, it took me more than two months to track down one fish because he had changed his appearance. He had grown a mustache and goatee, and he needed a haircut. His hair was sticking out. And he was wearing some eyeglasses, and his trick now was to pretend that he'd never met me before and did not know anything about our previous agreement to discuss radically esoteric questions of an immediate metaphysical or existential nature. But I found him again in the corner booth in a little restaurant on North Broadway in Lincoln Heights. And given the fact that he was only halfway through a plate of chicken and pepian sauce, Juan finally agreed, chewing with his mouthful and speaking in a fake Mexicano accent that I never heard him using before, since I knew he was born in Los Angeles and he was from here. So the accent was just some sort of affected mannerism of some kind, an act of some sort to answer the rest of my questions. Juan Fish is nothing if not a complex character. Part of his charisma is that he has so many different and seemingly complex facets to his personality. On different days, you'll get, a totally, you'll get totally divergent answers from him. Sometimes, like today, he'll even be speaking with a totally different accent and everything. So yeah, the, the interview goes on for, for a bunch more questions, a bunch more pages. Um, and, uh, and yeah, one fish is different every time they find him. And, and it's sort of about the, um, about always, always speaking in the same way to, to different people, always trying to hit the same register, always um, not being flexible with your, with your outlook, and plus asking um, annoying questions. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, you can't stop. You have to keep going. Um, what else? I have a question from online. Okay. From Tisa Bryan. Uh, were there buildings in LA with airship docks? Um, 
Yes. Uh, there was an airport in present-day Montebello, El Monte area, that was called the East Los Angeles Airport. Um, and Arturo has, has a picture of that uh, on one of the papers over here um, that we can't show you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, uh, right? We can. Um, and it has a derision on there. Um, so, yeah, there, there used to be a bunch of small airports in and around Los Angeles uh, before they created the International Airport and closed them all down. Um, but those were the airports that William Powell, uh, was, William Powell and the other um, uh, African-American members of the, the Gressy Smith Aero, Aero Clubs um, trained at. Gressy um, Smith, someone else. Yeah, Bessie yeah. Smith didn't fly. She she was a singer. Her own thing really well. um, she, she yeah she did her own thing. Um, but maybe they have Bessie Smith clubs too. Um, um, yeah, imagine, imagine a Bessie. No. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Wait. Oh, did they have real buildings? Um, part of that was part of that also was inspired by the Empire State Building. You know that it had a it had a um, a dirigible docking. Uh, it still does have a dirigible docking room at the very top of the Empire State Building that they won't let you go look. They won't let you go in there and see. But you know, like it's there. You can sneak in there one day. Um, yeah, a friend of mine. Friend, like this is off the side. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, we were in little Tokyo, and she said, "You know, let's go, let's go to the top of the New Otani Hotel. Oh, it's, not, it's not even like it's not even there now. What is it now? The Ritz or something? Ritz Carlton or something? It used to be called the New Otani. Yeah, it used to be called the New Otani. So we went up there, and, and we were like um, walking around on the heliport that on top of all those buildings." Yeah, you could you could go look at those things if they don't keep you out. Um, but yeah, so um, so that's part of it. And oh, there it is. That's that is the that is the East Los Angeles dirigible. Um, there's the dirigible. There's the, there's the buildings, and that used to be out in El Monte. That used to be right there on Ellen. <laughs> a dirigible docking station made out of Brussels sprouts. <laughs> um, it was it was the vegetarian. The vegetarian <laughs> Do you know that chicken? Yeah. <laughs> any any other questions or thoughts, comments? Yes. There's a there's a future in the novel, um, and the sort of transport lines there. There are all these people who are trying to resuscitate them, right? Um, uh, and actually get um, dirigibles back up in the air. But at the same time, there's like things are all falling apart, right? There's like climate catastrophe and. Uh, I wondered if you could talk about the future of the novel. I mean, there's so many different temporal dimensions to it, different histories and different moments. Um, but there's that kind of, not post-apocalyptic, but it may be kind of what we're living through right now, but a little bit more intensely or consciously um, experienced by the characters. And at the same time, they're still trying to resuscitate this history. Um, of these transport lines. Yeah, I, I like I like those parts of the book because I think to me to me it's it's like two things like it, it does on a certain level like I'm just reading that passage those parts and I'm just thinking about how a story can tell you where you're at at the moment like when you don't even recognize where you're at and sometimes like climate catastrophe is happening right now. There's been like climate refugees for decades and 
the literature, the story helps me see where I'm at right now. Um, it also reminds me of, of being in a social struggle where things like for, like I was, I was kind of sharing earlier, like um, in, some, in some imaginations, sci-fi post-apocalypse happens in the future, right? Like it's something that's gonna happen to us in the US. And to many people, um, you know, we're already post-apocalyptic for like 500 years or 400 years. We've already faced that. Um, and so, as in, just in my personal life and my, my history, uh, my parents were Chicano activists, are still involved social, in social struggle. I'm involved in social struggle uh, through my art and also in my position as a member of United Teachers Los Angeles. Um, it always feels like things are falling apart, and it always feels like you're recovering and building. Like that's just the dynamic of being in struggle. That's, I think, I think what Sessu's writing, what I read in it, is there's a, there is like a tribute, a love, and a beauty of that, um, despite its horrors. That there's always people um, acknowledging where we're at as things are falling apart. They're recovering, building, uh, and. Um, Enduring, enduring and surviving. So I used to have a neighbor directly across the street named Carlos Montes, um, later moved away. Um, but he was a co-founder of the Brown Berets. He was one of the organizers of the East LA Blowouts of 1970 or 69, whatever that year was. Um, and, uh, and he's still doing it. Like he's uh, in his 70s. You know, still wears a beret, um, still like uh, working with the community service organization and others in Boyle Heights organizing against um, police killings of, of youth in, uh, in, in Boyle Heights and in the area. Um, but right, like, uh, where are his comrades? You know, where are the other people? So, um, uh, yeah, I was. I grew up during the rise and fall of the Chicano movement, you know, where it kind of uh, rose to power and brought tens of thousands of people out on the street, was subject to heavy police repression, um, people being killed and so forth, and jail. Carlos was one of the East LA Six who was indicted on um, conspiracy theories, conspiracy, not conspiracy theories. He was indicted on conspiracy charges uh, of firebombing Ronald Reagan at the downtown Hilton, you know, because uh, like one of Carlos's comrades was the LAPD informer, um, who was the guy who brought the firebombs to the. It was a, it was a conspiracy. Yeah, it was <laughs> a conspiracy. Yeah. Uh, and so um, and so Carlos went underground in Mexico for like seven years, and then came back. Um, but. Um, but yeah, so these these movements, they had their they had their rise and fall, um, and like uh, I grew up in those communities. I I met these, I knew these people. I saw you know what they went through, and and I saw some of them burned by the movement. Some of them burned out. Some of them you know bitter about everything. Some people like Carlos, sort of steadfast, true believers not willing to let it go and maybe it's you know sort of too hardcore always wanting to do the same always wanting to carry a banner down the middle of the street whether you know just change the change the wording on the banner um uh but you know within that whole spectrum of people in the community people people in struggle and um and yeah, continually seeing resurgence so that, I don't know what you were doing during the pandemic, but <laughs> I was like uh, passing out food with these, with the El Sorino People's Pantry. Um, and I don't know, you were doing stuff. What were you doing? During the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, we were, well, I, was, I was teaching. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there was a lot of mutual aid stuff going on, a lot of, uh, anti-eviction work going on because of the booming eviction crisis. 
It's like, I think there was, I saw like a resurgence, or like a, a fortification, organization of, uh, of tenants unions, especially in Northeast LA, where I, I kind of know more than in other parts of LA. But um, yeah, there's, there's, there's always things kind of like disappearing, getting burnt out, being destroyed. And then at the same time, there's this counter, counterbalance or counter movement towards resurgence and, and rebuilding. Um, I think that's kind of like one of the reasons why they call it a struggle. Did I answer your question? Okay. Yeah, and in many talk today, we heard you talk about backlash and community and the thing is like reclamation, but we've also heard you talk about like trust and not the right, you know, in a positive way. So I'm wondering if you could talk about maybe if, is there a relationship there between trust testing to access or a community or disrupting in a form of trust testing in the name of access? You tell me what you said. <laughs> um, yeah, I think what I heard is um, there's like this idea of trespassing. Um, trespassing as a way to, to access to for access. a community or for like a future imagining or even just resources, really, really like good. Yeah, sorry, Yeah, like. Um, well, there's a whole, there's a, there's a character in the book and a whole subgroup of this collective that, um, so there's a, there's a collective that is uh, happening throughout the years and all the time periods of the book that is trying its best to make this dirigible happen, right? Like this dirigible line happen. And um, one of the techniques or the tactics that they have is to steal stuff um, from the decrepit aerospace industry. Um, and it's also, a reference to it's also a reference to privatization and enclosure of, of land and goods, uh, hoarding of resources, and then the lengths that uh, we can go through go through to get those resources resources back um, to socialize them or make them for the public good. That's kind of one of the ideas of the. Of the dirigible company, it's like for a, it's like a public good. Uh, public transportation is a public good, and yet, like they're stealing from an aerospace industry that is not for the public good. That's like a very privatized, wealth hoarding um, industry. And um, but one of the other things about the book is like it, it's you know there's a constant argument and folly within the group, um, and they're always like fighting with each other, having ideological disagreements, um, other types of personal disagreements. And, uh, but that's all happening at the same time where some of them are, are using the tactic of like uh, maybe repurposing goods or, or stealing things or just going into empty abandoned hangers to fashion new ideas out of like old abandoned uh, aerospace pieces. When I, when I was growing up in, in LA, um, there were airplane manufacturing plants in the valley. They, there were, there was a GM car manufacturing plant. They made cars here. Um, they still make stuff here. It used to be <laughs> the center of the airline industry in the United States was in Los Angeles. Um, and so you are growing up when that's been raised and erased. Um, and partly from people's imagination. You know, these things don't, um, uh, Sarah Schulman wrote a book called The Gentrification of the Mind. And part of, was her book was about how um, the AIDS epidemic erased a generation of artists in Manhattan. Um, and so it, you know, the AIDS epidemic partly erased a kind of imagination from the nation. So, yeah, um, part of part of the anachronistic character of our book is to remind people that um, that that there's this history that uh, there used to be an aerospace industry that they actually shipped. Uh, my friend, um, uh, whose dad used to work at the McDonnell Douglas plant in Long Beach. They shipped the entire plant 
to China. And he went with it in order to show, show, show the Chinese people how to run this plant. Like, where is the plant in Long Beach? Well, it used to be in that empty space right there, and now it's like over there. And so, um, yeah. And so, uh, like, all these things that, that are in these pictures, they, they represent the reality of people's lives that was just like a generation ago. Um, and so, yeah, you guys are young. That's good. <laughs> good to be young. <laughs> I've got maybe a last question, and it's about um, toward the beginning there, um, within the, the activists trying to bring back the dirigibles, there, there are two factions the fiction faction and the movie faction. And there's a there's almost subtext about LA and the way it's been represented in movies, right? Which is something you're pushing pretty much against, right? By creating other spectacles. Um, and a lot of them are spectacles of language, really. All the, also spectacles of image, right? Um, not, no movies, no moving images in the book. The stuff man. We tried. We tried. <laughs> so can, can we talk about the, the fiction faction and the, the movie faction? Yeah. Um, well, so part part of the part of the narrative of the book obviously is trying to be a counter narrative, which means trying to counter the narratives that we all absorb by the colonization of our mind by Hollywood, by the Hollywood, by like you know, and I totally hear like uh, like actual you know published poets seriously discussing like Marvel movies on Facebook. Like I see them like oh, I like the Black Panther, yay. The black guy. <laughs> um, meanwhile, like they're they're totally just colonized by the narratives of, of Hollywood, and the the guy who used to be head of the Marvel Marvel um, Marvel whatever it is the Marvel the, they call it the Marvel Universe. Um, they call it the Marvel Universe. The guy who used to be head of the Marvel Universe. He was a Trump supporter. Um, he gave he gave those money like those people would pay their money to go see those movies, and he gave their he gave their money to Trump. Um, and so yeah, like part of it is meant to be counter narrative against the colonization of of our mind by John Wayne Airport and everything else that that is that is like actual physically in our environment and in our mental environment from when we're growing up and we'll never, maybe we'll never be able to eject it, never. Yeah, so the faction, fiction, so fiction, faction, <laughs> fiction, faction is arguing with, um, with the movie faction. The movie faction wants to make a movie of the dirigible company to raise money to build the actual dirigible company. So they're like the gradualists, the ones who say, you know, get in the system and reform it from within. Right. And then the, the radical wing is arguing that that's a waste of time. And, and, and saying, uh, do it now. Yeah, they're, been, they're calling the other side the needles yeah. and sellouts. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's always, there's always, you know, there's always that tension. In, in organizations, is like how far can you push it? Uh, maybe some people are pushing it too far. Some people are not. Some people are. Those people are going to destroy our organization. Yeah. And the other people are like, I was always for Joe Biden. You want to wrap up? You want to read one? refresh? Read read another piece. Let, let's have one more reading. Yeah, I think that'd be a nice way to think of you. You pick it. Thank 
Um, I don't know if we're going to get to it or not, but, but one of the people who's alluded to, not named, but alluded to in, in this chapter is a graduate of Cal Art, of MFA Cal. <laughs> I don't know, she doesn't get mentioned by name. Her organization is there. Mel turned on Huntington up to eastern south toward the freeway and sat in all glowing like the city was on fire. That's just how it is, but it's not worse. Everybody driving with their lights on, uh, even if it doesn't help much to cut the blowing clouds of particulate and debris, pedestrians wearing face masks and head wraps hunched over like it, hunched over against it like a desert sandstorm. Now there's a haboo for you. Everything glowing orange from sunlight refracted through carbon dioxide. Uh, they say, and the wind tearing through the streets. Mel and I have never witnessed a major debris landfall. Nothing crashed down on us. We've just seen the aftermath, a telephone pole in an intersection, or people driving around it, shipping containers on the top of a store, or a billboard on top of parked cars. Sometimes you hear an explosion or booming. What is that, you know? Day or night, the street full of flying objects, trash, litter, papers, plastic containers, sticks, leaves, hazards. Carry safety goggles. You don't want an eye infection, lose your sight like my aunt. Even if she did regain partial sight, at least in one eye, like maybe after a year. And the whole deal will give her a better relationship with my cousins, who, who she always treated outrageously after all. My cousin Lucy said about that. You live long enough, you may change your attitude. You, you never can tell, I'd suddenly clear up, turn into one of your typical outstanding sunny Southern California days till the wind shifted back. We wended our way forward, the station wagon like a boat, parting the curtains of dirty air, atmospheres pattered, a dry rain atop the car, the ancient rain trying to peel off our heavy duty Rust Oleum special paint job. Spare parts piled in the back, back seat filled with water jugs and cartons of East LA Bloom Club paperwork that swirling told us to guard with our lives. But sorry, as it happened, when we pulled over outside the Southgate station, the mooring mass appearing and disappearing like an abbreviated Eiffel Tower in the smoke, dust, and debris, Mel's door caught on the wind, which jerked it open and sucked out a stack of folders, papers, and photos of Eric and Edna flew up in the air, out over the car, one slapped me in the head before it slipped into the wind. All those pages of secret histories made a few flapping noises, then zip, zip, zip. I don't know what was in those files, but away they went, sucked up inside the dirty sky, become one with the trash atmosphere. Some could have floated down in the LA River, but I don't know if there was any water down there, or just a mess of plastic I couldn't see. Mel slammed the door shut, and we rushed to the station door. Mel held the door for me and the wind slammed it shut behind me. I swallowed the dirt in my mouth. Inside, people sat at tables drinking coffee from the coffee counter in the corner. The big windows threw a yellow light into the room. The window glass had been replaced, as was common nowadays, with acrylics so scoured by sand and particulate that traffic on the distant street beyond the unpaved parking lot flowed by in shapes and blobs. The word afik, backwards, could be partially discerned above the apparently homeless old guy who sat lifting a cup to his face hidden behind the gray locks, curling out of his jacket hood. His luggage, several resoaked canvas mailbags, was stacked behind him. In another corner, several families waited in the plastic chairs, small children playing, the adults napping. The television mounted above the coffee counter was either off or broken. The morning mass above the station channeled vibrations of the wind to us. Everything resonated audibly or inaudibly, more obviously or less obviously. Could have been nerves, too. The waiting room was full of people, but it wasn't clear if they were in transit with a long way ahead and weary from the morning commute, or just waiting inside out of the wind. Next to the ticket counter, gate one, to the passenger boarding bridge, tapped and creaked with changes and pressure. 
If you told me that guy was a statue, I'd believe you, Mel said. If you told me that was swirling Alhambra, I'd believe you, I said. Maybe this was where our boss disappeared to, she said. Retired, looks like. Nobody's behind the ticket counter. Figures, Mel, and I, Mel tisk. Annoyed, she, she, she rapped sharply on the window. Then she waited, no sign of life, rapped again. That's bullshit, she said, leaning forward to peer into the ticket office. Do you have to report this? I walked over to the door to the office and opened it. It's not locked, I said. Um, the place was jammed. People were camped out. Plastic tarps and tents filled the big garage like stalls in the marketplace. Food truck on the far side blocking the wind somewhat at the open door. Mel and I stepped out next to the big long tables set up with buffet style serving pans where Ray Palafox, Ray of all people, pudgy rock and roller Ray, curly haired boy toy in his Guns N' Roses t-shirt, bleary eyed and pale and hygiene free. Not up before 2 p.m. Ray, serving food in a Southgate garage. I was astonished at the sight of Ray in his mute motorcycle jacket, as always, not because the garage was crammed full of... Hey, Tina, Mel, welcome to Southgate Station, Mikey broke. Mikey, Mel said, nobody's manning the ticket counter. Can't fly till this weather lets up anyway, plus food not bombs. Food not bombs, Mel muttered. Mikey explained food not bombs was show and salt of the earth and Buster Keaton's steamboat bill over and over for refugees from the most recent firestorm. Ever since the government only recognized corporations as citizens and stopped helping actual people, refugees jammed the roads. Food Not Bombs had set up a vegetarian buffet for people who hadn't had hot food in days. Jose Uriarte brought in his taco truck and set up the salsa, even as Ray Palafox mobilized Los Quemados to blast out Indias or whatever they call it, in a free concert and got his band members and their entourage to come out to assist refugees who lost their houses and everything. I made sure to step over and tell Ray I thought it was great what he was doing. He shrugged, saying he had family himself in the burn. He probably remembered me from self-help graphics or somewhere. Ray thanked me in return for getting Ella Dot to shelter the people like this. I didn't tell him it was all Mikey's idea. We could see people were busy, so we headed for the door. But we didn't get out of there in time because Mikey asked if we take boxes of food and clothing to South and one there, Ella Dot Station which had also opened up to shelter fire refugees. Sure thing, Mel Rumble. Make sure to keep a box of avocados for yourself, Mikey told us, as he and the guys literally crates and boxes on top of the junk in our station wagon. We got way too many and they're all soft. They'll go bad before anybody can use them. He said, big hair whipping in his face. No, it's not there. Sounds good. Okay. <laughs> Thanks to Kellers and all of you for coming out. Thank you so much. Reception is downstairs at the bottom, as, as was as we did two minutes ago. Thanks for coming again, Mike. <laughs> 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 <laughs>